Hey everyone. So today I'm going to, this video is going to lead off from uh, yesterday's class where we went through the pre-processing of a Surat object um, of single cell sequencing and we did our normalization, our scaling of the data, and then we integrated our Surat objects. And now we get to the part of this single cell workflow where we actually try to generate uh, single cell clusters where it, different clusters represent um, different cell types. And then we're gonna actually uh, go ahead and try to find, um, try to identify different, um, the, 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 the different cell types as well as through, through uh, identifying differentially expressed genes across clusters. Um, so the first thing we do, we take our, um, integrated object from yesterday, and we're going to run a, um, we're going to initially start to cluster, um, generate clusters from these single cells. Um, the first step in this process is to uh, do this find neighbors um, function, which is just happens before we can do our actual UMAP reduction. Um, I encourage people to um, learn as much as you can about how UMAP works. It's all very interesting. There's a lot of um, underlying math that I'm not going to go into for simplicity, um, but there are tons of online resources that explain how this um, algorithm works. And I think it's really useful for um, for being able to, to fine tune the algorithm for different purposes, depending on the experiment that you did and depending on the questions you're trying to ask with your data. Um, so when we run, when we run this run UMAP function, we take our um, our object that we already um, ran this previous function on. Um, we're asking it to look at this integrated RPCA um, data slot, so the the data that was integrated from our in our uh, from our previous day um, using this RPCA algorithm. Um, and then everything after this, this dims, this end neighbors, and this minimum distance parameter. These things are all very tunable. Um, and so particularly this end neighbors and this minimum distance parameter are really useful in, um, or really uh, they have, a, by changing these values, they have profound effects on the way the clustering actually looks. Um, and so you might, for your experiments or for your data analysis purposes, you might play around with these values quite a bit, lowering and increasing them um, and uh, doing so in a combinatorial fashion, and you'll be able to see that um, changing these values really um, has a has a profound impact on the way the clusters actually form. And then the next uh, step we do is we're going to do a find clusters, which doesn't uh, at all affect the way the clusters look, but this resolution parameter does affect the numbers of clusters that are identified. And so with a higher resolution parameter, you're going to create more clusters or Surat is going to infer the presence of more clusters from an identical um, plotting shape or plotting um, orientation. And a lower resolution will um, identify maybe only one or two or three clusters from the exact same plot. Um, and so I'll kind of show you what I mean. Um, and so when we, uh, when we want to plot the, the results from these three functions, what we do is dim plot um, we could change the point size, and then we can change this group by parameter because um, this is essentially the, this is where the metadata that we added to the Surat objects yesterday um, really comes into play, or today, I guess, um, because we can actually color the cells based on these different metadata designations. So earlier we had our assigned gender and T21 status as metadata that we uh, we assigned. Surat clusters is, a, um, is assigned by Surat, and it's um, it's essentially the the cluster designations for individual cell. So when we do these plots, we end up with a plot like this, and we can change the point size. This is a little bit big, um, but essentially what's going on is each one of these points is an individual cell, and they are uh, segregated into clusters, um, and these clusters are segregated and shaped based on these end neighbors and these um, and this minimum distance parameter. Let me see if I can get it. Um, so the, this end neighbors and these this minimum distance parameter is essentially what determines the shape and the, the global structure of this plot. Um, whereas the find clusters function only, and the resolution parameter associated in that function only determines the number of clusters that are identified. So with a higher resolution parameter, we might get 25 clusters. Um, with a low resolution parameter, we might end up with only five or, or 10 in this case. Um, so I found that this resolution parameter was decent for creating a, um, 
a, a good global representation of clusters. So we have 13 clusters. They seem to be pretty well segregated, but we're not overfitting. And so we're not generating tons of clusters in this group of cells here, whereas um, it's clear that this is actually likely represents a, an actual single cell type. And ide ideally, we're going to um, make it so that individual cell types represented as a distinct cluster here would only be um, assigned a single uh, cluster variable. And so I encourage you to actually play around with different resolution parameters and different end neighbors and minimum distance parameters. And I think that'll help you um, understand how that affects this plot. Um, and then we can go ahead and plot, we can color the cells by these, these uh, um, by the, the metadata designations that we assigned. So we can color the cells by gender. So whether they came from a male or female um, fetus. And so we can see that overall the, um, the, the effect of gender is relatively small relative to the effects of different cell types, um, which is ideally what we're gonna, we wanna see. We wanna see that our experiments are integrating well across gender and across other um, variables that we don't wanna directly assess. But on the other hand, T21 versus D21 cells um, are segregating quite distinctly. Um, it is a little hard to tell. And I will say a lot of times this, um, the plotting, the way the layering works makes it a little bit difficult. Um, there are workarounds with this. We can, there's a way to shuffle the cells before um, plotting them, but essentially the cells are getting plotted in the order in which we integrated them. So we can see that underneath this big cluster, there's actually a lot of greens, uh, teal, whatever color this is. There are a lot of cells under here um, and vice versa. In this group here, there's in, among behind plotted underneath these red cells are a lot of these teal cells. Um, so it is a little hard to determine sometimes. We can also change the opacity of the, of the cells, which help us, helps us kind of identify um, differences like that. But nonetheless, we do see that there are groups of cells that seem to be either from T21 or from D21. I guess primary, here's a kind of a D21 cluster only, um, but we do see a lot of uh, groups over here and over here and over here that are um, primarily D21. And so once we have this plot and once we're satisfied with our parameters and we're satisfied with the the, cluster, the numbers of clusters, we think that the numbers of clusters are accurately representing the, the cell types that are um, that we'd expect to see from, a, from an experiment. Now we actually want to go and identify these cell types. Now, a lot of people think that this is done automatically when we're doing um, single cell analysis. There are ways of doing this um, and Hope is going to go through this after, after um, She's hopefully going to have a separate video, and this is we're going to go through this in the class after this section. Um, but from all of my experience, these um, algorithms that are supposed to identify cell types doesn't uh, doesn't work as well as you'd hope, and it really depends on the tissue and the experiment that you did whether or not that's going to work for your purposes. Whenever I've had to find um, cell types, I've had to do so manually, um, and the way we do this is we use basically these two major function, functions. So one is called find all markers and one is called find markers. Um, so what find all markers does is it takes every cluster and it compares every cluster to every other cluster. And it does this iteratively through all the clusters. And what we end up with is a, a list of differentially expressed genes associated with each cluster. Um, so we can use uh, the tidyverse to organize and plot this data frame that comes out of these um, all, that comes out of this find all markers function. Um, and that allows us to sort by cluster or sort by, um, or group by cluster and then sort by log full change or sort by p-value adjusted, um, all kinds of, we can sort by any of these values. Um, and so we can use these um, different values to better understand what genes are associated with each cluster. So in this first cluster zero, so let's see, this cluster zero is this big red one here, um, and the clusters get smaller. At, so the, the way the numbers work is that um, zero is always the biggest cluster followed by one, two, and three, and then the last cluster is always the smallest. Um, and so when we're looking at cluster zero, we see these genes. And so in this case, we're sorting by full chain. So we can see that this gene here is in cluster zero, has a very low adjusted p-value, essentially zero, it's probably not actually zero, but there's a limit to which R can um, calculate p-values. Um, and we see that there's a high fold change. So within cluster zero, um, this gene IL1, RL1, has a five-fold um, log two-fold change enrichment relative to all other clusters. And so this is, an this is a very high fold change. 
However, when we look at these two columns, so percentage one and percentage two is the percentage of cells in the cluster expressing it here and the percentage of cells outside the cluster that express that gene. Um, so really in cluster zero, only 0.2% uh, um, or maybe 28% of these cells are expressing this gene, whereas outside that cluster, uh, 0.016 proportion of cells are expressing this gene. Um, so using this full change and this percent expressed um, together will give us, begin to give us a better idea of what uh, genes are expressed um, specifically in which cell types. Um, we, can all, we can also look at the, uh, the top 10 genes based on this value. So we can see that um, in cluster zero, these ribosomal protein um, genes, RPL10, 39, and so on, um, Though they have a lower full change, they also have a very low p-value, meaning that th these values are very different. And so we see that in cluster zero, all cells are expressing this gene, whereas outside that cluster, only uh, 0.85 um, proportion of cells are. Um, so we can kind of use these different um, sorting methods to identify, um, begin to identify which um, Clusters are associated with different cell types. Um, we can also do this type of comparison by um, the metadata that we assign. So I can set the ident. So we can set the main, um, basically the, the main identities of these cells based on T21 status, as opposed to which is the, the default. What happens is it gets set to this Syrah cluster um, designation, but I can set it to gender and I could set it to T21 status using this function here, set ident. And then I could do find all markers. And now what it does is, is it compares um, T21 versus D21. Um, and I can do, a, I can subset based on Syrah clusters. So I can, um, within cluster one, I can then I can then do a comparison where I'm comparing T21 to D21. Um, and essentially what happens is we end up with a list of genes and we can use this feature plot function to really plot and look at which genes, we can visualize the, the, the genes that are expressed in these different clusters. So in this case, I found this gene SLC4A1 and I found that it was highly expressed in this cluster and, and a bit more in this group here. Um, and so we can go through genes that we see coming up from this list and we can begin to plot them just to visually verify that these genes are actually expressed and um, in these clusters, and they really do look like um, they identify. So when I look at this plot, I see that this gene does a very good job at distinguishing cells in this quadrant of the UMAP relative to basically all other clusters. While it is a little bit expressed here and there, um, this gene seems to be very distinctly expressed in this cell type over here. Um, and then, now the part gets a little bit more nebulous depending on, the next step gets a little bit more nebulous depending on what you're actually trying to um, do and what cell types you expect. Um, in this particular case, I don't, I don't know this experiment all that well, and I don't know exactly what we'd expect from these fetal bl blood samples that um, the sequencing is from. But when I would, um, when I did my work on skeletal muscle, um, I knew roughly what cell types that we were expecting to see from our single cell data. And so I was able to basically do literature searches where I'd look through each cluster, I'd look through the genes ex associated with each cluster and do Google searches, um, as well as there are some databases that show different gene expressions across different cell types, depending on the tissue. But essentially you have to do this manually um, where you start to look at the top genes um, and, you, I, and sometimes you Google these genes and it's really obvious, oh, these cells are expressed only in, in B cells or only in T cells. And then we, um, get an idea that maybe that cluster is um, a B cell, or maybe and maybe these clusters are T cells. Um, but really, it's 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 usually not that simple. Usually, it's more of a holistic approach where I have to look through a bunch of the genes in the top twenty through either full change or through the percentage of cells expressed, and then collectively I start to gain an idea on what the different cell types are. This is pretty. Um, uh, laborious and it's rather subjective. That being said, if you, it's usually pretty clear um, what cell types are what, and as long as you report in a, in a, in a publication um, the 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 different sources that led you to un, led you to believe that a certain cluster is a certain cell type identity, uh, from what I understand, that's pretty um, that's pretty common. People just um, will cite the source that says this gene is expressed in this cell type. And usually that's more than enough to um, exude confidence in that this cell type is that cell type. That being said, 
we are, as I said, improving the algorithms that are, are supposedly able to do this automatically. Um, and so moving forward, these things will probably become more popular and, and more effective. Um, but a lot of times it requires you to have an, uh, a pre-understanding of what these, of what cell types are and, and have a reference file that you provide, um, which for different tissues and different organisms, we might, you might not actually have that. Um, and so I'm going to stop there and um, let you Play around. Hopefully, after after you get through this worksheet, you can play around with plotting these different genes um, and observing um, how they look when they're um, expressed, and then um, and how how they look across different uh, cell clusters. And then hope will lead you through um, how to do this more automatically.